What the heck is going on with our country today? It seems like everywhere you turn, you see big government, a lot alone professional associations, going after people's individual rights and freedoms. Here to talk about and update the, the state of the nation when it comes to uh, justice in our country are leaders from the Justice Centre, namely John Carpe, the president, as well as lawyer Marty Moore. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you could join us. I'm, I'm, I don't know what to say, whether I'm going to cry or I'm excited about finding out what's all going on across our great country. But it's remarkable the number of cases that you're involved with. And, and I should just pause for a sec. Uh, John, you're the founder of the Justice Centre. What do you do at the Justice Centre in brief? I am responsible for fundraising, always a big priority because we are we do not ask for or receive any government funding. Uh, so we're funded uniquely, exclusively by voluntary donations wow. from Canadians. Um, I write columns, I speak at conferences, and I'm involved in running an organization that, that's got about 20 people. And... Um, I think my my main job is uh, encourager and motivator in in, in in chief, and say, look, you know, things are things are bleak, and they might get worse before they get better. But it's our job is to uh, fight hard, to stand up for truth and justice and freedom. And uh, I, I'm very honored and very fortunate to have great colleagues. Well, the Justice Center is an amazing organization. And, uh, you know, it's a, a not-for-profit, as you say. It's all sustained by donations. And it is truly on the front lines of fighting for Canadians' uh, rights and freedoms. Is that it? We, we have well over 100 cases. Uh, at one point, we were, we were up to uh, close to 300. And uh, we have been, and, and I think we still are, the, the leading defender of charter rights and freedoms in Canada. We've got, uh, we've got a network, a uh, team of about nine lawyers and five paralegals. And so we're defending freedoms of expression, religion, conscience, association, peaceful assembly, mobility rights to, to move and travel, uh, the right to bodily autonomy to decide for wow. yourself what medical treatment you want. Uh, so we're the, the leading defender of rights and freedoms in Canada today. Well, it's truly a remarkable organization. And um, so before we kind of get into some of the more specific cases and maybe the larger picture of what's happening across the country, I did want to ask you um, a really fundamental question, John, because you've seen a lot over the years. But why, why is it important to Canadians? Why are, are rights and freedoms important to Canadians? If we want to remain uh, a free society, which we've generally been for the last 50, 100, 150 years, where every person can practice their religion, uh, can express their opinions in a peaceful manner without fear of getting silenced or censored, where people can associate freely or not associate with whom they please, uh, where people can enter and leave the country freely. If that's the kind of country that we want and I think most Canadians do, then we have to fight for it because the trends currently are towards, slowly inching towards a communist China style social credit system. Whoa, sorry, communist China style? That almost seems, what, histrionic, John? What What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, we got a small taste of this with the vaccine passports two years ago. All of a sudden, every person in Canada is required to have personal private medical information on their phone that they have to divulge to a total stranger who could be a hostess at a restaurant or mm -hmm. a, a ticket attendant in a movie theater. And we have to divulge personal private medical information to total strangers. 
and those who uh, are, you know, the uh, the bad people that did not get injected with the COVID vaccine are turned into second class citizens who cannot freely enter and leave the country, cannot travel with freely within the country, uh, cannot go to restaurants, movie theaters, cannot participate in sports, cannot have their kids participate in sports. Uh, we got a small taste of that. And, wow. uh, you know, the way it is in China today, if you criticize the communist government on social media, you will suddenly find yourself unable to board an airplane or a train. And this is something that the, the technology is here to, to have that kind of a system in Canada. And unless Canadians fight hard for our rights and freedoms and make it very clear that we want a free society, not a totalitarian slave state, then that's the direction wow. that we'll continue to move towards. Okay, so I've known you for a couple of years, John. Would you have said this, dare I say, five years ago? No, I was shocked at how quickly, how readily, how easily, and in some cases, how enthusiastically Canadians gave up their rights and freedoms in 2020. Obviously, if, if you cannot have Christmas dinner with your mother or yeah. with your daughter or your son, you're losing your freedom of association. Yeah. Okay, that's so, just one example, and I, I wouldn't have imagined that uh, that that so many Canadians would be so flippant and cavalier uh, about their rights and freedoms in the face of, of very repressive measures that took them away. Wow. So, but is is that really fair though? In the sense that surely we all heard the 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 message, the 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 drumbeat of fear that hey, this is the end of the world as we um, took on a virus that had a high mortality rate that was going to, frankly, be uh, jeopardize us all, and we had to lock down society. So you didn't quite buy that, or, or what, what, what are we saying here? Well, you know, the, these measures, the first week or two or three, four weeks, maybe even five or six weeks, uh, sure, there was fear. We didn't know what was going on. But but. The data was there. The facts were there quite early on mm -hmm. that the initial predictions by Neil Ferguson, Imperial College, mm -hmm. or Premier Jason Kenney compared COVID to the Spanish flu of 1918, which it decidedly was not. I mean, we're talking COVID is 1% of the Spanish flu of 1918. I mean, there's just no comparison. Um, we knew early on that that COVID was not the unusually deadly killer that it was made out to be but there was this mass panic and the fear once the fear got a hold of people uh it, it just persisted in mm -hmm. people's minds and hearts and and that's very unfortunate yeah. because the the facts were available early on that yes covid is real yes covid is a serious threat to maybe 10 percent of the population if you're elderly and have comorbidities but the facts were available quite early on and people did not want to look at the facts yeah, and, uh, that's unfortunate. No, it was very frustrating. Of course, it was a dynamic situation. There was a sense of, quote, emergency. But we do know a lot now. Um, gosh, it's almost coming up to almost three years now. It's hard to believe. But we know a lot now about COVID-19. In fact, we know almost too much relative to what different decision makers knew at the time that we're not in keeping with the narrative, which is kind of almost bizarre. I think of the UK texts from different ministers, um, you know, that knew that there were issues that were actually quite safe, but they wanted to keep ensuring that there was a, a sense of fear and, and lockdown. We, we know a lot of information about the vaccines, they're, uh, that, that they're not necessarily safe or efficacious. They didn't stop the transmission of COVID-19. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But so. But these are not the only rights and freedoms that are a result of, like coming out of COVID-19. There's a whole host of them as well. And we'll get into that as well, right? But so I'd like to turn to um, Marty Moore, because I think that coming out of COVID-19, there was a lot of impacts on people and including, it, it's amazing, the government's push on what I would characterize as peaceful protesters. And I think... Um, uh, Marty, you've you've been in the weeds with a number of these files. Uh, can you highlight one of them that illustrates, dare I say, some progress being made? Uh, I think of Evan Blackman as an example. Can you tell us about that case? 
Yeah, well, this is a this is a Freedom Convoy case in Ottawa, and of course, you know, the Freedom Convoy was was sparked by just the the citizenry finally saying enough is enough. We need to go to Ottawa and voice our concerns. The the nation's capital. There was a large protest there. Mr. Blackman attended that protest on a particular day that happened to have a line of riot police on the street. And they had now, through the federal government's Emergency Act declaration, emergency is a, a, a term that you often hear to, to violate people's rights, the Emergency Act declaration. And then they decided to clear the entire area in front of Parliament Hill, mm -hmm. free of any protesters, peaceful protesters or not. And Mr. Blackman was one of the people there. He was charged at his trial. They presented the evidence of a police officer uh, saying that, you know, you are obstructing police. You are committing criminal mischief by being there in your nation's capital to protest, to express your peace, your, so, your political. So just him being deeply. present was enough to charge him. That's what they 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 were were claiming. Just you being present at this protest was an act of criminal mischief and you being on that street when the police decide to clear the street the fact that he was backing up the entire time that the police were moving forward uh, they were still charging him with obstruction so our lawyer uh, went to court there to defend him in a trial uh, just last month uh, the trial included actually video 15 minutes of video of of this line of police moving forward you can see mr blackman there saying you know encouraging everyone to maintain the peaceful nature of the protest de-escalating situations uh -huh. and then of course the police announced we're going to arrest everyone here what does mr blackman do does he resist no he gets on his knees awaits for the police to come and and take him uh, he actually had so much time that the video shows wow. him him taking off his hat and singing the national anthem that is the person that the Ottawa prosecutors chose to criminally prosecute. Potential imprisonment for this. So why? And, why? Under under what pretext, Marty? Under the pretext that, that his participation there in the protest was criminal mischief and obstruction. And after the hearing of the evidence, uh, the judge acquitted uh, Mr. Blackman of wow. all charges. Uh, that was our fourth victory. Uh, that That's the fourth matter mm -hmm. we've had gone through a trial with, and that is the fourth uh, acquittal of a peaceful protester in Ottawa of all of these charges. Wow. We still have more than a dozen of these continuing to yeah. go on. But congratulations but they, on that uh, that victory. It must have well, been quite it's, a... It's a privilege to fight for these these individuals and to have the justice center support to, to do that mm -hmm. and and yes it is is something that we're very grateful to do because these again are peaceful protesting canadians being criminally charged yeah. for doing that so so in the in the judgment um what was the bottom line why did the judge dismiss these charges there's no ev evidence of criminal mischief anywhere. Yeah, There's no evidence right. that this man was acting yeah, but, to obstruct the police. And again, that's the fourth time we've had a judge say that to the Ottawa Crown, and they've continued to press okay. the issue, so, saying so, that peaceful protesting is somehow mischief or obstruction. Right. So, so where is the judge then coming back to the Crown, cautioning them with these kinds of actions? I mean, these are, uh, frankly, a, a, a waste um, of of precious resources uh, to go after these types of cases, and and you said it yourself. There's there's a number of them. It's not just a small number. It's there's many of these right across the country, and yet these crowns continue to persist. And I know that the the the, the crown prosecutors, it's by their discretion, but there's an element of trust that their discretion is within the law, and it, it su suggests to me that someone's encouraging them to pursue these cases, even though they have no pretext. Is that correct? In my view, uh, these prosecutions uh, bear more of a hallmark of a political uh, pressure yeah. than they do of a legal, of, a, of the proper exercise of legal discretion. Of course, the absolute massive expense to the public purse uh -huh. that these prosecutors are engaged in. I mean, we just, uh, we're at day 27 of the Chris Barber trial and, and Tamara Leach there as well. Yeah. Um, you know, that trial was estimated to take a total of 16 days. The Crown's case was to take 10 days. Day 27, the Crown 
finally rest their case. Okay, so- and so now our lawyers will be getting up there uh, to to mount a defense. But, you know, a massive expense to peaceful Canadians who would, in other words, they, they'd have no means to to defend themselves against that onslaught if it wasn't for, you know, for example, the Justice Centre stepping in. Well, and I, I and so bravo on you for defending these people uh, in these difficult situations, because the cost on them personally must be horrendous. Uh, and and obviously the Crown is really making, a, trying to make a, a, a kind of a political example of them. It's It's really quite disturbing. And I think the larger picture here, and I do want to go back to you, John, on this one, is that when it came to the the whole issue of the truckers um, convoy, and it's worth remembering, John, we still don't have any evidence uh, of of any health issues when it came to why they introduced this particular mandate focused at this particular group of independent truckers who spend much of their time in the day. And what is it again? Oh, yeah, their trucks. And there was no issues. Is that right, John? Well, you know, the science is just not there in in, in a lot of these cases to, to back up the government's position. Uh, we are uh, currently fighting uh, a case in BC, and I, I apologize if I'm jumping the queue. I don't know if you're planning on asking about it, but uh, health care workers in British Columbia, yes. including doctors and nurses that are not allowed to go back to work because two years ago they decided they chose to not get the COVID vaccine. Right. Yes, and now the BC healthcare system is is crumbling. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fifth of the population does not have a family doctor. Uh, emergency room waits are are through mm-hmm. the roof. Uh, staff are complaining about deaths caused by understaffing, and yet the government says, "Oh, we don't want these people back because two years ago they refused to get this injection." Wow. And we know we know definitively that 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 getting the COVID vaccine could only benefit the individual. It does not stop the transmission. Right. And yet still the government's hellbent. And so federally, we had a similar thing with, with yeah, the, these truckers who are by themselves in a a cabin uh, of, I think it's called a cabin. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're alone. And yeah, they all have to get injected, even though we knew that that the, 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 the COVID shot is not stopping the yeah. spread. Of transmissions, but the federal so, government has still not revealed any shred of evidence that that mandate was based on any kind of scientific evidence. In fact, what I understand within Health Canada, there are actually voices saying there's no point to this mandate. So it suggests that it was a political effort to try to create a wedge issue, right? To kind of villainize a group of people that were only complimented the year before for being heroes delivering all kinds of things during this crisis. But then the government comes back and under really using a health pretext when, when it's actually a political, uh, you know, kind of action to go after this group of people. We still don't see any evidence behind this to justify, do we? No, it's, uh, it, it, it's a sad state of affairs. And yet we have to continue to fight these cases in the court to we, we hold the government to account and we, we show we, we force the government to put its evidence forward. And more often than not, it, it's spectacularly unimpressive what the government has to, yeah. to, to back up its measures. Well, so this is a, uh, I mean, there's case after case. I think you referenced the BC healthcare workers fight against the vaccine mandates. And, and that's true that there's thousands and thousands of people that um, made a careful decision and choice not to get vaccinated. It's not because of you know, clearly most people are quite open to vaccination. But on this one, there, there are a lot of reasons to be hesitant. And interestingly enough, there are many healthcare care uh, workers. In fact, I've spoken with them. And by the way, I did choose to get vaccinated. But in, the, in their context, they said on, on closer examination, they decided not to get vaccinated. And ironically, the, the issue here is now we're short of, we're short of all these people and uh, they are still getting problems getting rehired. And that's what you're fighting for. Is that right? Yeah, at least 2,500 uh, p- people that we're aware of, but we have reason to believe the number could be higher. Uh, so the applicants in our court action are include administrators and medical wow. doctor. And uh, a lot of these people were were working remotely. And, and in some cases, the government actually replaced, fired the 
remotely working uh, person that had no contact with patients, replace them with a contractor who did not have to get the vaccine. Oh my so gosh, this it, is it like just, out of a gong show. So you're saying these people work remotely? They fired them. They hire contractors who, whatever reason, didn't have the requirement to get vaccinated, and then they're working. And that's true for a lot of the cases. I mean, there are also at least one of our applicants is is a medical doctor who was working with patients. But what we know that the uh, getting the COVID shot can potentially help the individual receiving it to avoid severe outcome. But we also know that it does not stop the spread. And we know that we've known that in, in 2021, when you had highly vaccinated countries like Israel and Gibraltar with, you know, 99%, 97% vaccination mm-hmm. rates, and the virus was spreading everywhere amongst the vaccinated population. And we've saw that we, we've seen this happening in Canada as well. So there's no medical uh, scientific justification to uh, coerce anybody to get the vaccine. It should be a choice that people make uh, for themselves, if they believe that the benefits are going to outweigh the harms, okay, fine. Uh, but but the whole the whole vaccine mandate was not based on science. Wow. So this is the point: is that you have to look at the facts, the evidence, and um, that's really our hope: is that judges will do their job. I know you can't say that, but I can. That they will look at the evidence and they will look at this and say this this made no sense whatsoever. That's what we're hoping for, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, in fact, and, and Section 1 of the Charter requires governments to uh, justify demonstrably with persuasive evidence that any government law or uh, policy or uh, decision by a government body that violates any of the Charter rights or freedoms, that it is actually doing more good than harm. The onus is on the government to prove that with persuasive evidence. That is the test uh, that that the charter requires. Indeed, and yet we've seen we've seen uh, judges that will say, "Well, there's a seem to be a little bit of science to back up the government's yeah. position, so good enough. Uh, you know, let's move on." And uh, we've got some judges that are rubber stamping uh, charter violating policies wow. that should not be yeah. approved. Shame on them. So I do want to turn to some other interesting cases on a somewhat different topic, moving away from COVID-19. And that has to do with defending free speech for healthcare professionals. And I want to turn to you, Marty, because there's a fascinating case that you're on the front line with, and that is Amy Ham, who's a nurse in BC, who dared to think that there's two genders, male and female. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, her her situation, and she's the, being there represented by uh, lawyer Lisa Bildy with uh, support from the Justice Center. Mm-hmm. Her situation came to the attention of her regulatory body because she decided to endorse a billboard in Vancouver that said, I love J.K. Rowling, who happens to be one of the world's most notable advocates for women's rights. Okay, for the so fact th- that- this is the, the uh, world famous author of, of Harry Potter fame. Uh, the author, and 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 she, of course, went in publicly and said there are only two genders, male and female, if, if memory serves me correctly. So so the nurse, Amy Ham, was saying, I, I agree with that. Yeah, essentially with that, and 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 because of her participation in that public billboard in Vancouver, which was actually taken down the next day, yeah. uh, she was then subject to complaints, not from any of her patients, but only related to her public expression supporting you know spaces for women such as a women's only rape wow. shelter where they wouldn't be exposed to men uh women's bathrooms those kinds of things and now for the last three and a half years she has been subject to discipline processes uh again thankfully represented by council but now 20 days of hearings have concluded uh, just this month actually and Four expert witnesses were provided on her behalf before a disciplined body of the BC College of Nurses and Midwives to deal with such compelling questions as, is sex real? And the actual expert evidence being provided in that case to this medical regulatory body to prove that, yes, Ms. Amy Ham, a nurse, is speaking the truth sorry, you're when bringing, she affirms sorry, the reality of sex. You're having to bring in, quote, experts 
that can say definitively before this regulatory body that there are, sorry, be, before a judge, that there are two sexes, male and female? Yes, this that is exactly it. Before a regulatory body, uh, we are putting forward experts because the case against Ms. Ham is this, and this is literally a quote, the science is settled that gender essentially trumps sex. And, and our position is, what are you talking about? The science wow. is settled. The science that is settled is that there are two sexes. And and that is what our client, uh, Amy Ham oh. is speaking. Utterly and bizarre. of course, the, the propaganda that's being pushed. Yeah. And that's what our experts are actually attesting to. Yeah. Our Canadian experts on these issues are attesting that if that is the position of the college, that is propaganda. And so this is a very critical fight. But th 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 this is also, uh, it it's tyrannical in that, uh, as Marty mentioned, th there's no complaints from patients about receiving inadequate care from this nurse. This is about her wow. com comments on, on Facebook. Another example of that, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, probably the most famous Thank Canadian you. in the world, uh, with his college going after him. Again, no complaints from patients about getting poor quality care or, or harmful treatment, but just the college alone that is uh, after him for disagreeing with his politics. Uh, I can give you other examples involving lawyers and teachers. And so we are uh, fighting back very hard against this because... Um, Lawyers, teachers, doctors, nurses, psychologists uh, should enjoy the same charter rights and freedoms to, to expression that that uh, every other Canadian has. Yeah. And we all have compassion for people that are confused about their gender. Uh, no, this is something else. This is not about compassion um, on behalf of those professional societies, in my opinion. And what we're having is, well, what 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 is going on here? What's driving this nonsense. I mean, I, I see this across the national stage. You see all kinds of select representatives being attacked and trying to take down. There's a, a school trustee in, in Winnipeg, Francine Champagne. There's uh, one in Alberta. I mean, they're all across the country. They're being systematically attacked because they dare to speak up for parental rights and that young children, minors, should not be sexualized as one example. I mean, who doesn't I mean, poll after poll and survey shows that most Canadians, uh, you know, are, are on their side. And yet there's these groups that are going after them. What, what's, what's driving this utter insanity? I think it's a hatred for our traditional Western civilization with its rights and freedoms, uh, our Judeo-Christian civilization, mm -hmm. if you would, from which... Uh, you know the anti-slavery movement has has come about, and and women's movements and movements for free speech and religious freedom. All of these things are a product of our civilization. What you have is a woke, hateful neo-Marxism that sees the whole world as being a perpetual battle between oppressors and victims, mm -hmm. and so the oppressors are males and lighter skinned people and heterosexuals and the victims are uh, darker skinned and women and gay and they don't recognize really the individual humanity of each person and the capacity that each one of us has as a human being to do good or evil to choose what is right or wrong uh, to make good choices and bad choices to be to be kind to people mm -hmm. or to harm people they don't they don't really believe in the dignity of the individual to make choices. What they believe is everybody is either an oppressor or a victim, and it's a permanent state of war. And so this is the ideology mm. that is, is certainly dominant in uh, on university campuses, uh, seems to have gained the upper hand in a lot of the professions like the uh, the law societies, the College of Nurses, the Sorry, College of Psychologists. Even the law societies are infected Yes. by this hate-filled ideological claptrap. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you see it. Uh, there was a lawyer in Alberta who was um, 
reprimanded and removed from his position for having written on Twitter that that Black Lives Matter was a Marxist organization. Which it says it is. Which apparently is true, uh, but nevertheless, you know, you, you, oh, 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 you shouldn't say something bad about Black Lives Matter, right? Why? Because you've got this narrative wow. that everything's about racism and oppression and this and that. So if you say something uh, critical of Black Lives Matter, uh, you, you're going to have the law society get on your case. So it's a very aggressive ideology uh-huh. and, and, and it is very, very simplistic. And so it moves ahead very uh-huh. aggressively, very quickly. And uh, its simplicity has got a certain appeal to a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, when you're fighting back against it, uh, you know, people on our side, typically, we don't necessarily always have our, mm-hmm. our short, simple slogans well, ready to, you know, fight back. <laughs> and I think for a lot of Canadians, they're shocked to hear this kind of brilliant summation that you did, John, uh, because they're busy doing what? Oh, yes, living their lives, working hard, looking after their families. And for them to take energy, valuable energy, and start fighting this is just like, you know, it's it's kind of like another world. Whereas you have these, I think, a very small group of activists that are trying to push this kind of ideology. And then you have institutions that have almost adopted it uh, for many different reasons, not the least of which is it means a larger state because they're all for uh, taking the state to, to really to take over everything. Um, and, and I get it. People are socialists. They can advocate that perspective. But uh, no, this is something a little bit different. They're, they're, they're really wanting to take over and run your life. Uh, I mean, it sounds hard to believe, but am I being unfair in terms of my kind of summary there? Well, if they succeed in silencing the doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, nurses, I mean, the next steps, they're, they're going to move in, into the other spheres and say, well, every licensed electrician, every carpenter, every plumber has to, you know, in order to be a licensed professional, you've got to sign on the dotted line saying that you salute equity, diversity, and inclusion, and that, you know, they, uh, it doesn't stop, really. Mm-hmm. So um we have to defeat it here, or otherwise you get to a situation where you cannot earn a living in, in Canada. I could see journalists as well, mm-hmm. uh, journalistic associations, or or the government could say, you know, anybody working for a registered charity like the Frontier Center uh, has to sign on the dotted line saying that they agree with equity, diversity, inclusion, exactly. and they agree with, with uh, uh, an anti-oppression framework, and that you're sympathetic to uh, you know, LGBTQ and trans rights and whatever. And you get to a point where you have no freedom of speech left. And so we just have to fight back very hard and say, no, uh, people like Amy Ham can speak the truth and uh, state accurately that there are only two genders. I agree. So it, it almost seems like we're adopting this um, bizarre, hate-filled secular religion, dare I say, and, and I could talk about that for quite some time. So but, but speaking of religion, um, there's another case, Marty, I did want to, to mention, and that had to do with Dr. Robin Francis, as I recall. And it sounds like it, that's a, a religious case as well. Could you talk about that briefly? Absolutely. And this, this actually kind of brings us back into the, the realm of COVID. And you'll recall after the 2021 election in the fall, uh, actually, Minister Qualtroth, uh, Minister of Employment, said that if anybody in Canada doesn't get the vaccine and is fired from their job, she will see to it that they will also lose their employment insurance benefits that their own premiums have entitled them to. And that's the situation of of Robin Francis. He was working remotely, by the way, from home when his employer said everyone needs to get the shot. He's submitted a religious exemption application. There were people that that were concerned about the way the vaccines were manufactured, utilizing uh, stem cells derived from aborted fetuses. That was his concern. He he raised that issue. He was summarily ignored. And then he was immediately fired, really without warning. The policy didn't allow him to even be fired in those circumstances. And when he went to apply for it, EI benefits, which, as you know, are Mm -hmm. subsistence level benefits in order to feed his four children at home. Exactly. 
the federal government said, no, you were fired from your own misconduct. Wow. Depriving you of the EI benefits your premiums entitled you so, to. So the federal so, government's almost taking a punitive approach at these people. Like they're they're persecuting a person who legitimately weighed in as a religious matter a, a, of religious conscience. This is the worst case in my profession I've ever seen of kicking someone when they're down. Horrible. This is stealing from the man who's been assaulted on the street. That is what this is. Wow. And so we've been representing uh, Mr. Francis through uh, a very lengthy, laborious, administrative morass that the federal government is, and finally broke out and got to the Federal Court of Appeal, where you're hoping that the courts would take the time to consider the case. Oh, it's, it's and I disturbing. am regretful to say that at the Federal Court of Appeal, the judges dismissed Robin Francis's case from the bench, ignoring his charter rights entirely, figuring that they didn't even matter. Wow. For Mr. Francis, he might well have been living in a case that doesn't recognize or living in a country that doesn't recognize any freedom of religion. Yeah. We will be seeking leave from the Supreme Court to appeal. But it, it is one of the most compelling and, and really heart-wrenching cases because, you know, it didn't just happen to him. It happened to thousands of Canadians. Yeah, very disturbing. And Godspeed to the Supreme Court. So when it comes to uh, so many other matters, I mean, there's just so many hundreds of cases. But one of them that I'm also intrigued about is the, the case of Trustee Mike Ramsey in Waterloo Region. Can you tell us about that one? Sure. Well, Mike Ramsey uh, is a longtime trustee. He was a former cop. Mm -hmm. He is a Jamaican immigrant. He's got a great rapport with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, long time standing up for, for common sense Indeed. and community values. And, and it came across when he, sitting as a trustee, was in a meeting. And, an, and another of our clients, actually, Carolyn Burjowski, raised a concern in that meeting that said, you know, there's a bunch of books that we have in our libraries. And let me read you one that is actually minimizing the sterilization of kids and promoting this, this trans ideology to children. And she began to read that book and she was interrupted by the chair of the school board and silenced and then kicked out of the meeting. And trustee Mike Ramsey stood up for her and said, this is not right. And for standing up for for Carolyn Burjowski's right to speak to elected trustees on this issue, Mike Ramsey was then subject to discipline from his own oh, for Pete's sake. trustees. On, on what authority? Does on the basis school that board... he had violated some code of conduct provisions uh, regulating decorum and, and other things. So we represented him through the, again, the administrative process, yeah. which was geared against him. Uh, his fellow trustees, you know, on party lines, huh. essentially voted to censor him. Uh, we then appealed to the court of appeal or sorry, to the, to the court in appealing that case. Um, Mr. Ramsey in this case, by the way, which is, is a, you know, just an issue. I think I must bring up in the actual hearing of the case, he was subject to the worst racial attacks by members of the public joining in to observe that case that I have ever seen. So here's Sorry, a man. I'm, I'm utterly confused. The man is black and you say he's subject to, to racial attacks? In what respect? The use of the N-word was screamed at him repeatedly in the court hearing, which was proceeding Sick. via virtual means. And yet he stood strong. He went through with that court hearing that day. It's now pending a decision uh, to, again, this is an individual speaking up for the truth, speaking up for the freedom of others, and it, harrowing those kinds of criticisms, those kinds of ad hominem attacks. And again, it's an honor to and privilege to participate in representing wow. him. Well, I'm as you know, I was a mayor in Waterloo Region. I'm, I'm utterly shocked and ashamed to hear that because that's not the tradition at all of honorable debate and discussion. And, um... and, and you know, David, it does speak to uh, the broader issue, which in a free society, you put your idea up there, it is scrutinized, yes. there is a debate about it. But when your ideas cannot stand up to scrutiny, well, then the only way you can attempt to defeat your opponent is to intimidate, is to use ad hominem mm -hmm. attacks. It is to silence them. And that is a country that if we allowed it to 
go on is going to tend to a totalitarian state. These are the freedoms that we must fight for. Free speech, the most basic of all principles. And so again, we're looking to a court to uphold uh, Council, uh, Trustee Mike Ramsey's uh, right to free speech and his right to defend the free speech of, of other staff and, and family members uh, to speak about the issues affecting their children. Well, indeed. And, and um, again, I'm very disturbed to hear about this and let's hope that sanity prevails. Uh, including our rights and freedoms. But what's at stake here from a larger picture, John, is profound. And I think you've alluded to that before. But as we have healthy debate, it's it's the search for truth. And this has been our tradition, not just over hundreds of years, but a thousand years. I think of the Anglo-Saxon tradition going back a long time. But in this case, I, I also think that the benefits of seeking that truth are, are really profound as we work together and live in peace and respect and tolerance, dare I say. And when it comes to this, what's also at stake is our prosperity. Because without these kinds of debates, we don't have discussion based on evidence, but we, we give up prosperity. Is that a fair comment, John? Yeah, the search for truth is, is one of the strongest arguments for free expression, that if you have the government you know, and whether that's a communist or fascist or theocratic or national socialist or, you know, just plain Jane autocratic without any ideology, the moment that you have the government silencing speech and people self-censoring so they don't get in trouble with the law, mm -hmm. you don't have the robust debate that you need to arrive at the truth in different realms. And we could be talking about philosophical truth, theological truth, political truth, mm -hmm. scientific truth. Indeed. Uh, you're probably familiar with the female physician who was a heretic by suggesting, I don't know if it's 100 or 200 years ago, yes. that, that doctors should wash their hands before delivering babies uh, because there's a very high death rate amongst women after giving birth. And it was a doctor, happened to be a woman, who said, hey, uh, we've got a problem here. The doctors are just walking in off the streets and delivering babies. And she said doctors should wash their hands. And she was mocked and ridiculed, uh, but it proved to be that she was correct. And now today we've got everybody, uh, you know, all the doctors are washing their hands. That's just one example of how science uh, progresses. And so it's the same thing with good laws. If, if we want good laws, and we all do, uh, you cannot have good laws if you stifle debate about what is right and wrong and you know which evidence Indeed. is strong and which evidence is weak and what works, what does not work. If you've got debate shut down and a bunch of name calling, then you don't have a good solid discussion and you end up with with bad laws. So th this is um, this is why free speech is going to remain probably the number one priority for the Justice Center in the next 12 to 18 months. Is that right? Including, you know, defending uh, defending our free speech on the internet as well. That's another big threat that is uh, looming. Indeed. So I am so glad that uh, we can turn to our friends at the Justice Center, uh, John Carpe and uh, Marty Moore, for the kind of leadership and work that you do every day on the front line, fighting for our rights and freedoms. And it's very clear that we can't take this for granted. And so let us resolve in 2024 to be able to speak up. And so on that note, I ask you the question, John and Marty, what can citizens do to move this forward? Because this is a very disturbing uh, set of revelations we've heard today. I think first, uh, first and foremost, uh, be informed yourself. Um, yes, listen to the CBC and other government-funded media. However, do not let that be your sole source of information. So turn to other Definitely sources not. like, you know, you've got the Frontier Center, you've mm -hmm. got the Rebel, you've got True North, you've got the Justice Center. Get information from multiple sources. Keep yourself informed and uh, uh, take an active part in the democratic process. Uh, there's an old pr French proverb that if you do not do politics, then politics will be done unto you. Well and so, uh, you know, be be involved in the in the democratic process. Uh, your federal MP, your provincial uh, MPP, MLA should know who you are on a first name basis, and you should speak up about issues and uh, uh, and actively support candidates that are 
uh, standing up for for truth and justice and freedom. So be an active, involved, engaged, and informed citizen. That makes a huge difference. Well said. Well, I want to just uh, bring this to a close. Thank you so much, John Carpe, president at the Justice Center, and Marty Moore, a lawyer at the center as well. I want to thank you for your courage and your leadership and for joining our conversation today. The honor is mine. Thank you, David. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.